Thank you, Mia. It's very nice to see you all. It's great to be back. Uh, and uh, as Mia said, uh, great that uh, people are watching is, uh, or, uh, at this moment um, virtually. This is the first uh, live streaming event Marine Money has uh, done, but uh, we do believe it will be a feature of our event uh, going forward for our members. Uh, we have uh, quite a full uh, program uh, ahead because it's live streaming and people will be signing in from abroad. We'll try and keep to our timing as much as we possibly can. Uh, and I'd like to introduce our first panel. The title of the panel is Shipping's Prospects, Prospects are Stronger Than for a Decade, The New Responsibilities of Shipping. Our moderator is Mr. Harris Antonio, Managing uh, Director of Neptune Maritime Leasing. Uh, Harris, over to you to please introduce your uh, panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, good morning, everybody. It's exciting to be here. And uh, it feels like a celebration because you know we're back all together again in a physical uh, context. I think it's the first Marine Money physical event after the uh, COVID. Uh, and I'm glad to see so many people attending and wearing their masks as well. Um, it's it's, uh, it's uh, truly exciting to have a great uh, panel uh, today. Starting on my left, we have uh, Sadan Kaptanoglu, who's here re representing BIMCO as the immediate past president, and uh, you know, there's a history behind it, maybe you can explain this later, uh, on why there is this title, immediate past president. It's actually very interesting. And uh, we have Harris, uh, and also, of course, he runs Kaptanoglu uh, Shipping and, ship and shipyards as well. Um, and she is the president of Turkmepa, <laughs> which is the, uh, uh, the equivalent of Helmepa in uh, Turkey. So welcome uh, to Athens, uh, Sadan. Of course, we have Harris Kosmatos, who's the Corporate Development Officer of uh, TEN uh, Limited uh, for many, many years. Um, we have Leon Patitsas, CEO of Atlas uh, Maritime, and uh, last but not least, Heraklis Prokopakis, COO and Treasurer of um, the Naos Corporation. So a, a, a great panel. We're going to cover a lot of topics, probably too many on the agenda for the 30 minutes or about 30 minutes we have uh, uh, in, uh, in this panel. And I would just you know, like to say that uh, we've been all through a, a, a tremendously difficult uh, time from a social perspective and, and health perspective, but uh, it was also a time that created new uh, trends, new normals, um, uh, and, and we wonder whether a lot has changed. In fact, we see the proliferation of the, the digital world. The conference has been uh, broadcasted all over the world. Uh, here from Athens, it's a hybrid conference. And in, initially, you know, when we saw this huge dip uh, in uh, global economy and shipping as well, we were shocked. Uh, and, and we asked ourselves, you know, whether really we're going for a fundamental change in the way the world is uh, behaving. And despite the fact that it's all gone digital, and despite the fact that probably all of you have bought something, or probably buying something uh, electronically through e-commerce channels every day, shipping didn't change that much. Actually, it rebounded very sharply. We're probably enjoying one of the best times in containers and, 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 and dry bulk. And, and uh, Leon will tell us, and, and Sadan, what's going to happen in tankers. So what is uh, your view, uh, lady and uh, gentlemen? You know, has something fundamental changed in shipping? Are we in for a new uh, paradigm? Um, and because last time around, the, you know, 10 years ago, uh, just after the financial crisis, was a commodity-led boom. Now we have a boom again. What are the fundamentals and how do you think uh, shipping is going to react? Perhaps I can start with Sadan uh, sitting next to me. So this is always what happens when you are the only woman in the panel. Just say everything <laughs> starts with you. Uh, good morning, everybody. It is a privilege for me to be here. And, uh, you know, all my BIMCO presidency was, you know, I attended a lot of meetings, but I was alone in the room, you know, looking at the camera. So it is, I'm, I'm really very happy to be here and, you know, seeing all of you in person. Um, uh, well, this is a, maybe easy, but at the same time, it was a tough question. I think uh, the reason is that, that during the pandemic, shipping did an excellent job. So we didn't stop. Everything flow as it is. And although we were suffering tremendously, especially from the seafarers' point of view, 
but we feel all our responsibilities. But that's what we do in shipping. That's what the ship owners do and with all the shipping people do. Now, uh, we are welcoming the booming market, which is very nice. Is it another super cycle? To me, it's a question mark, because this is the result of a lot of disruptions. And of course, the biggest disruption is the COVID itself. Um, I believe that it is too early to say if things can go as we know, or it is going to change dramatically because we are still in a transition period, but not only from the shipping point of view, but as a whole world. And on, on top of it, I think we have greater challenges regarding the climate crisis. We do not call it InterMEPA or HELMEPA as a climate change anymore. It is a climate crisis. And I think also the pandemic is the result of it. So right now we see the, the market, especially container I drum up is booming. Eventually tankers will follow as well. How long it will be the question mark. And of course, you know, uh, we do not see, I mean, there is an increase in the maybe orders, but not as much as it should be. It's because uh, for the coming future, we have no idea what kind of a vessel we should build or what kind of a new technology we should install our vessels. And these two days I was watching, uh, you know, like all of us, uh, you know, news and now I just, you know, it's, we are all over the news. I don't know if you watch it last these two days that how, you know, uh, shipping is uh, creating emission as big as, you know, uh, Germany. Uh, but there is a good part of it because we are used to beat up with this, although we are ready to comply and we are committed uh, that Amazon, uh, IKEA, Unilever and another six company is declared that they are not uh, going to use uh, fossil fuel vessels uh, starting from 2040, which makes me think that, that maybe you know, the whole transition can be only done if we are working all together. This cannot be on the shoulders of uh, ship owners. And now this is, I, I want to take it this as a sign that now the charters are ready to do their part of the uh, bargain. Yeah. Thank you. So then we will see. Great, I mean it was you know, a long-winded answer to a simple question. <laughs> But I'm going to push it on to Heraclius on the other side of the, uh, of the bench. Are we in for a new super cycle, especially with a view to container shipping? You don't need it's on. It's on. It's on. I had to first find the way to use this. <laughs> <laughs> to remember how to use it. Speak into it. It's on. Pretend you're on the camera. In front of the museum. Can you hear me well? Yes. Ah, okay, good. Good morning to all of you. Uh, a lot of familiar figures, but not familiar faces with the masks. So I apologize to anyone I didn't say hello because of the masks. It happens with a couple of people down there. On the question, you know that we always had problems with shipping when it was an oversupply of ships. For us, and I will stay only in the, in the <coughs> container, uh, sector, uh, we, the, we depend, as far as demand is concerned, on the consumption. Consumption of finished goods. And consumption of finished goods, it's always there. And it will be there. So we do not really worry too much about the demand. We worry about the supply. So. 2020 and 2021, it was not really two years to draw conclusions out of it. The disruption in the supply chain created a tremendous problems, inflated the demand and deflated the charter rates. Whether that will be sustainable or not, it's a question. However, I have to remind to the audience that by the end of 2019, container 
sector has already started to pick up. It was a disruption for six months and then because of the excess demand and because of the disruption in the supply chain, the industry went skyrocket. I have seen things which I had never seen being 40 years into the shipping industry. So I think that our sector is healthy. There is no over construction. And for the next couple of years, we shall see the situation that we see already. And thereafter, I think that we are going to enjoy a continuous healthy market. You talked about oversupply. Uh, obviously, that, that's spot on. If you look at the demand supply curves now going forward, uh, we see that by the beginning of 2023, when this order book starts getting delivered, we have the inverse uh, happening. There'll be a surplus supply uh, compared to uh, demand. So uh, is the party going to last only a year and a half from now? What do you think is going to Because there's, there's a big bubble of, of new buildings that are going to be delivered from 23 onwards. Indeed, there is a, approximately 21% of new buildings over the existing fleet. However, it was approximately 5 to 7% oversupply at, by the end of 2019, and the market started picking up. Yeah. So I'm not worrying too much about this 21% unless new building will continue the way it is, because I feel that the demand will be there to support the uh, trading patterns. Okay. So I I'm not worrying too much about it. So no black swan uh, related to demand? Uh, not to my opinion. We're going to talk about that later. Leon, uh, you are in the fortunate position of having ordered tankers uh, at the right time in the cycle, but the market is not picking up. Uh, and, and Harry, you're also in tankers, so you probably have to answer the same question. But um, you know, what's your view on the, on the tanker market? Are we in for a super cycle, or we're not going to say that? Good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, very much, Harris. It's good to be back and to have uh, a real life physical uh, conference and see everybody in person. Uh, what happened during um, the pandemic uh, was like a black swan event. I agree with you, Harris, so nobody expected it. It was similar to a war. And what happens after a war is usually uh, GDP growth goes up a lot. So all the governments around the world uh, provided fiscal and monetary stimulus. Interest rates went to zero and fiscal stimulus was in the trillions of dollars. So the economy is growing again at 6%, and uh, we are seeing a reconstruction of uh, the economy globally. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, energy prices going up, uh, natural gas prices have doubled, the oil price has almost doubled, and coal has appreciated substantially. So we see real demand for commodities around the world, and we believe that um, uh, the tanker market will be strong uh, next year and the following year. The fundamentals are healthy. The order book is quite low. Most of the yards are booked with containers and dry bulk. And um, the fleet is getting older. New regulations are coming that will require all the vessels to be scrapped in uh, 2023 and onwards. Uh, so we believe uh, the market will be quite strong. The only um, concern somebody should have is with this energy crunch uh, and with the energy prices going up, this might be a dent to the global economy, might uh, yes. impact the global well, economy. It's a good, it's a good uh, remark because it also um, uh, you know, touches upon sort of inflation trends uh, that we see, and probably this is the next subject I want to touch upon. But I would like to, you know, give the floor to uh, Harry as well to, you know, give us his view sure. on tanker market and the energy crunch or crisis. 
Uh, thanks, Harry. And uh, again, hello, everyone. Very good to be back and uh, not, uh, at least for once, for the last uh, two years uh, to talk in front of uh, live people rather than uh, in front of a screen. So uh, thank you, Marine Mandy, for, uh, for some reason inviting me again to speak. Um, well, on your point, and, uh, and uh, I totally concur with what uh, uh, Leon said, uh, I think the tanker market, if it wasn't for COVID, uh, would have been in, in, in a super cycle uh, a year ago. Uh, it's totally COVID related. Uh, all the fundamentals are in place uh, for us to take off. Uh, it's all a matter of demand and, 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 and when that demand uh, materializes into, uh, in, in, into kind of higher freight rates. Uh, we are in the tanker space. Uh, we are currently in uh, the lowest order book in recent memory. I think 20 year lows, uh, under 7% of the order book. Uh, let me remind you when the market got uh, uh, destabilized uh, a few years back, uh, it was like 20%. Uh, so substantial decrease in, uh, in vessels uh, that are uh, joining the fleet. Uh, concurrently, we are seeing the departure of uh, many vessels for, for various reasons. Uh, uh, primarily, you know, environmental, uh, from the charter's point of view, they do not uh, take on longer term contracts uh, uh, vessels of, uh, um, of uh, let's say, 15 years or over. Uh, and in a low freight environment, uh, and with, uh, with uh, the potential of uh, very expensive uh, special service ahead, incentivizes, uh, entices owners to, uh, to, uh, to depart, sell the vessels uh, for, for scrap. And has, hence, we have seen an acceleration of uh, scrapping over the last uh, couple of months. It started uh, uh, slow, but uh, we have really seen uh, scrapping accelerating to levels that perhaps could, uh, could be reminiscent to the levels that we saw back in 2018, which was, uh, I think, at, uh, uh, close to historical high levels. So uh, combining, and uh, as uh, Eraklis said, uh, uh, shipping uh, troughs and especially prolonged uh, uh, weaknesses have been primarily led, uh, uh, are supply led. So for the time being, we are into this very favorable environment, very low order book, very high scrapping, uh, demand is coming back. Uh, I think uh, uh, um, with, uh, with the U.S. opening up again uh, from November 8th, we're going to see hopefully uh, uh, a pickup in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, travel, in air travel. We are missing those barrels. We're missing those barrels. We have recovered uh, from, uh, let's say, from the 100 million barrels uh, a day prior to the pandemic. We went down to the low 90s. We're like 96 point something, point seven, I think, today. We need those four million back, and uh, the majority of these are, you know, the jet fuels that uh, that uh, need to be uh, to, to to come back to uh, uh, you know on, on the equation. And we believe that uh, eventually, assuming we don't have any uh, any uh, drawbacks on some new COVID variant, but it seems that uh, things are uh, under control and uh, and the COVID gradually goes behind us, uh, that uh, the tanker market finally will uh, will uh, begin to pick up. When nobody knows, uh, of interest, uh, we are seeing asset prices going up in tankers. Uh, over the last uh, few months, especially, uh, uh, well, I wouldn't say especially, but uh, across the board, even older vessels, uh, they command anywhere between 5 and 10 percent, we have seen an increase in, uh, in, in values. And perhaps that, uh, uh, that's a sign that people are willing you know, to pay money uh, uh, at some premium today uh, for what is expected to be uh, or to come over the next uh, few quarters. So we're positioning, uh, uh, even the company, we're positioning ourselves to take advantage of that. We have more vessels in the spot than historically. And, uh, and uh, we expect come the winter uh, that, uh, that, that the market will, uh, will take off. Are you not afraid that uh, high energy prices are going to put a dent on uh, growth, global growth, including uh, transportation growth? Uh, Maybe I can ask uh, Sadan just to move on. <laughs> um, well, uh, up to a level, yes, but it is all, you know, the way we shut down was incredible, just like exactly very similar to war. So regardless the cost of it, we have to speed up again. We have to go back to this, you know, uh, working economy. So that's why I just want to hope that uh, on the way there will be a balance. Because, uh, I mean, these difficult times will continue in the world because of the pandemic, you know. Would you buy so, a, a tanker today? 
Uh, I just bought a tanker um, three months ago. So, yeah. So yes. you're in I the mean, money. You know, uh, as a BIMCO president, I will always uh, speak of the conservative voice mm. and suggest all the ship owners be very, very careful. Uh, why? Because we like to carry the way with the markets. So, but I always say that never trust the ship owners when they say, oh, don't buy a vessel because you never know what we're going to do tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and, but what we do now, we look at the projects. There were a contract yeah. in Turkey against it. Okay. And so then, you know, we bought it. Would you buy a spot? Thank you. Today. Uh, <sighs> I, th I think the question is: Would you, uh, I mean, would you build a vessel on, on speculation or buy a second-hand vessel? Uh, to build on speculation, no, because it takes two years to deliver. So that's you know uh, a two-year runway in in the ship, and it's uh, quite far away. Uh, however, you know, to buy a vessel today in the spot market, as long as it's uh, of a relative uh, young age, let's say five, maximum seven years old, uh, I'd probably dare to say yes. Uh, but we will not build on on, uh, on spec no, no and, speculation. And Although uh, the market is not good now, so if you get into yes in what you expect to be a good market, it may be a better uh, bet because you don't have the negative carry of the immediate sure. market. Mm. But uh, uh, as uh, as I said earlier in my in in my comment, we are positioned positioned in the fleet, in the company, uh, even though historically we were more kind of time charter, secure, revenue oriented. About seventy percent of the fleet had. It was a uh, time chart covered. Uh, today we're uh, uh, around 50 50, and that's on purpose. We yeah, have would vessels. you buy a tanker today? No. <laughs> 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 and I don't have to ask Leo because you've ordered tankers. When was it that you ordered? Yeah, back in October uh, 2020. So, right in the middle of uh, the pandemic, when everybody was doom and gloom, everybody thought that the world was coming to an end. There was no light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, we started the negotiations and we ordered the ships uh, at the lowest point in the last 20 years. And we signed actually one day after they announced the vaccine for the pandemic. So we definitely believe in tankers. We sold um, uh, a bulker last week. We are always thinking counter cyclical. So we want to invest in the sectors that um, are low. And what is interesting though is that you bought tankers uh, at a period uh, that there's a lot of discussion about the new technologies. Uh, clearly, there is much more pressure. Shipping is producing approximately 3% of the world's emissions. The scrutiny is there. Uh, there's a number of alliances created to talk about, uh, you know, 50% reduction, zero emission shipping by 2050. And shippers are waking up to reality because of pressure from the clients and constituents. So what is, you know, how did you make a decision to buy conventional, let's call it, tankers uh, instead of waiting? Because there is a discussion about what technology are we going to use in the ships today? Yeah, we believe that uh, the energy transition will take much longer. Uh, there's going to be some transitional fuels, of course, like uh, natural gas. Uh, but fossil fuels will be around for a while. Eventually, everybody will have to move into ammonia or uh, hydrogen or other fuels uh, in order to meet the net zero emissions in 2050. But uh, we still have um, 30 years uh, ahead of us before that happens. But I wanted to touch upon uh, the inflation subject because we're seeing that, you know, all, uh, you know, from groceries, energy, uh, cars, furniture, everything is uh, going up. And inflation in the U.S. at least, it's at uh, 5 or 6 percent, which is a multi-year high. It's probably a 10-year high. And this is perhaps because of this monetary and fiscal stimulus, all this liquidity that was pumped into the market. And uh, we believe that uh, inflation is here to stay, but the good news is that real assets tend to outperform stocks and bonds during inflationary environments. So real estate, infrastructure, as well as shipping, tends to outperform during inflationary environments. Let the good times roll. And, um, but I, I want to go back to um, the issue of technology. 
um, because I think it's going to be one of the more fundamental you know, questions a ship owner and a financier you know, will need to answer uh, going forward. And um, uh, perhaps I can ask you, um, as an uh, operating officer as well, uh, actually, what is, you know, how are you positioning the company to deal with this technology transition to lower emission of fuels? Have you, what steps have you taken? Is the technology you believe in? I think there are two angles into uh, this uh, basic question. One is uh, new buildings and the other one is existing ships. Regarding new buildings, um, the technology for engines to burn new fuels like ammonia or hydrogen or ethanol uh, will be there after 2025. However, the availability of fuels will not be there. So the issue for the new technology as far as construction is concerned is not really the technology on ships, but the technology on fuels. So on the existing ships, on the existing fleet, uh, what we have done is that we have mapped all our fleet. We know exactly where do we stand with respect design and carbon intensity requirements, and we have already budgeted what we have to do in order to improve the ratings of ships that according to the supposed measures, because they are not definite yet, will be at lower uh, rating. So what sort of technologies? Can you give us a couple of examples? What are the changes? First of all, Regarding design criteria, you have to apply technology that will limit and certify your power. Regarding carbon emissions, you have to rate your ships relative to available curves and see how they go over the years, and then to uh, define what are the speeds that you may have to operate in order to meet rating criteria. And the next step is to discuss with your clients, because we have long-term contracts, what is the operating requirements that they have to comply, because they have similar ships anyway, in order to meet rating criteria and try to minimize possible taxes that they will be imposed on emissions. Do you include in your charter contracts uh, clauses that allow you to adjust the rate for, for this eventuality? We are in the same footing with our charters. Today it's a known as market, so nobody is discussing actually these sort of clauses. The usual understanding is that when the time comes, we shall see what we can do side by side. But, okay, speed is what you mentioned, but, but that's a, a passive measure. You know, you slow down, you burn less fuel. You know, are there any active measures that you are contemplating? Regarding car carbon emissions, no. There are not. There are, of course, measures... Like retrofits, for In example. design criteria to limit your power and, of course, reduce your emissions, which is on the EEXI measure. Yeah. But when you go to CII, where taxes may be imposed to any ton of carbon that you emit, then the only thing you can do on existing ships is to lower the speed. What, what are you um, uh, doing at 10 uh, Limited uh, in, uh, rela in relation to this? Sure. Um, well, I, I can give you kind of a, there are two answers to, uh, to uh, uh, potentially two answers to your question. Uh, one is that I mean we have just ordered uh, four vessels uh, for Afro Maxis on a long-term contract to, uh, to one of our biggest uh, clients. Uh, for the first time, we are venturing into a new kind of uh, design, dual fuel, uh, LNG powered. Uh, we'll see how that uh, that uh, will work out. Uh, obviously, it's not uh, perhaps might not be the vessel that uh, uh, will be. 
the ideal in 2050, but at least it's uh, you know the transition into uh, those kind of of technologies. Uh, so that's uh, a, a moderate uh, step that we're taking uh, uh, before we see what uh, uh, what ships will be actually required in you know 10, 20, 30 years from now. Uh, obviously, we cannot second guess the market, and I think this is very dangerous. And uh, and uh, all owners are led into uh, in, in, into a path that uh, we do not really see the exit. I mean, we're chasing shadows in terms of uh, technology and new emissions, and uh, you know, net zero. They all sound very good and sexy, and it's kind of you know the flavor of the month. And uh, you, you you have you know people like you know Greta going around the world and preaching the gospel. Uh, however, reality dictates otherwise. You know, you need to make money out of the business. Uh, uh, people need to, to to have their goods uh, transported from point A to point B. Uh, so we just cannot press a button and have you know a new vessel overnight. We just need to be you know cognizant of the fact that slowly, conservatively, steps need need, need to be taken. But we should not rush into any uh, an, any decision that could potentially render your vessel uh, obsolete in ten years from now. But, there, but there's not much time left. What, what, what is your view, uh, Sada? Also, as BIMCO. Well, that's dangerous. That, that comment is there is no much time left. It's dangerous, not from you, from the world, because you cannot, as, as I said, you cannot push owners into. Uh, w w we still haven't decided what's the future, uh, what's the fuel of the future? Is it hydrogen, ammonia, uh, what have you? That's a good question. So, what is the fuel of the future? There won't be one. I would love to say one. But no, there won't be one fuel, there won't be one solution, there will be multiple. The ideal scenario that I don't know if you know, any of us will see, but on the very long run, that a vessel will arrive at port and get whatever available. Yeah. So that is the idea of it. And let's focus on the tangibles. Uh, take yeah. existing fuels and try to do something with that. Uh, rather than build a vessel around it in, in the first place. We, we need to take it in steps. Steps or no steps? We definitely need to make uh, the ships more fuel efficient, and that's what we're doing with our new buildings. And basically, one of the solutions is to derate the engines and put a bigger propeller. So it's similar to maybe riding a bicycle, where instead of having a low yes. gear, you have a much bigger gear, bigger propeller and you achieve the same uh, speed with much better fuel efficiency. 25% so be... less fuel burned. So it could be that you do retrofits. At this, uh, you know, to, to get to that desired effect. Um, at this point in time, as we don't have, you know, much time left, we would like to open the, you know, the floor to questions from the audience. If somebody has a question, uh, please, question please? please raise your uh, hand to ask it. Don't hesitate, uh, otherwise I'll pick one. No, just okay. One, one last question from you then, Harris. Okay. Yeah. Just, okay ah, from me. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, it seems that the world is uh, rosy, even for tankers. We have a you know, rosy picture ahead of, ahead of us, despite the, you know, the fuel changes and electric um, uh, vehicles uh, coming to us pretty soon. What, is, what do you think is, you know, we have here two you know, listed companies, two private companies, do you think there's a, a bright future for shipping again in the capital markets? There's about 20 Greek shipping companies and maybe 50 global in New York alone. You know, do you see more activity there? And actually, that's one question. The second question, and I'm looking at Iraqis as well, <laughs> is also related to capital markets in Greece because we saw two companies issuing bonds for the first time ever in, in the Greek market. So if you could you know, comment on those issues, maybe i start with Iraqis. So do you want to take it? <laughs> um, no, we don't go to, <clears throat> to the Greek capital markets. We believe that there is not enough depth. And um, since we are a company rated by Moody's and S&P, and we have access to the international markets, we shall stay with the international markets. Um, uh, also, it's a euro-related issue, and we would like dollars, mainly. So with the hedging, if you take euros, the spread is not 2.7, the spread is 4.5. 4 so that's one thing. As far as the uh, capital markets is concerned and the share price, of course, we have seen tremendous um, moves into the share price. However, I have to say that still 
Um, share prices in most of the shipping companies are well below net asset value. Um, even if you take net asset values not being inflated the way they are now. So I think that um, uh, although short-term investors like funds, they are taking their profits, uh, they have a very short view anyway, and uh, they were locked in for a quite a long time relative to their uh, expectations. I think for long-term investors, it's still a very good buy. Uh, very two, uh, uh, two answers, uh, uh, short answers. Uh, I would uh, respectably disagree with uh, Heraclis. I think the Greek capital markets, they do have depth uh, because it's totally retail, uh, very uh, low barriers to enter for somebody to make a small investment. And we have seen that they have raised uh, you know, over 100 million very quickly. So that shows that uh, there is appetite for, uh, for investments. I think the test for, for the Greek capital markets in that sense would be uh, the aftermarket, what happens after. Uh, we need to see uh, that there is a following. Uh, we need to see banks uh, covering potential stocks if it goes uh, uh, in, into that direction. We need to see you know, analysts uh, uh, following uh, the stories. So it's not that uh, you, know, you just raise the money and then uh, forget about it. So we, w that's the test. You know, we need to put to the test on how you know, you know, the customers of the world, you know, the capitalists will get, what kind of following they will uh, get uh, uh, after. Uh, as regards the capital markets, uh, yes, we are all trading at horrible discounts, especially in tankers. And I'll, I, I guess I'll go into more depth in the capital markets panel uh, later in the day. Uh, I think we really need to see uh, uh, the big funds coming back, the big institutional investors. It's too much retail oriented. Unfortunately, as I directly said, uh, uh, the majority of investors today are short term. They, they do not take a longer term position. They want to take advantage of the volatility. Uh, and uh, and uh, hence, they do not uh, ascribe any significant values to companies that uh, are there for the long run. Uh, so, Leon, would you go public? No, I think that um, smaller public companies need to consolidate. They need to become bigger, uh, have more liquidity, and then they will be more attractive to institutional investors. And if the market stays elevated and, uh, you know, the cash flow is there and public companies start paying dividends and uh, reward the investors, I think uh, they will appreciate further and probably trade at the NAV or appreciate at a premium to NAV. We started with Sardan, we're going to end with Sardan. What's your view on capital markets? Well, um, I think we ship owners are very creative and we will be using them and I think it will, we will see the increase. And you know how when shipping crash, out of sudden you are old fashioned and nobody wants you. And then the shipping comes up and then everybody thinks that, oh, this is such a traditional market. You know, we really need in our portfolio. So we are used to this game. I, I call it dance actually. So, and, uh, but the, the more we get sophisticated, the more we must use the sophisticated tools and the capital markets, especially one of them seems that they're here to stay. So thank you, uh, everyone, for your participation. Thanks, everybody, for your attention. Thank you very and, much. Uh, we'll thank see you. you next time. Thank you.